Datu Sri Idris Jala is a Sarawakian Malaysian of Calabic descent whose ancestors were once headhunters. Now, he was born dirt poor in the jungles of Borneo, but through sheer hard work, education, relentless drive, and a lot of ambition, he rose through the rank, ranks at Shell, the global energy business, to turn around some of its most uh, and most troubled business divisions a- around the world. Now, this ability to, to turn around even the worst of loss-making businesses led the then Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Abdullah Ahmad Badawi, uh, to, to name Idris Jara as the man to help transform uh, two of Malaysia's most troubled GLCs, uh, firstly with Malaysia Airlines and then lat- latterly with Proton. Now, since then, through uh, Pabandu Associates, the company he helped form and still runs today, uh, Idris advises corporations and governments all around the world to deliver sustainable socio-economic reforms, which in 2014, some of the abilities of which led Bloomberg to name Idris as among the top 10 most influential policymakers around the world. But you see, Idris is so much more than that. He's so much more than a corporate turnaround specialist and a former minister in the PM's department in Malaysia. Idris is also a musician, a storyteller, a family man, and a man devoted to his faith, Christianity, without which he says, much of his success might not have happened. Now, this is my conversation with him. Uh, It spanned over 90 minutes officially uh, in our interview, but much longer before and after that, over breakfast and then lunch and then coffee at the Asia School of Business at Bank Negara's headquarters at Jalan Tata On. It was a chat which convinced me that that Idris could have been one of those rare Malaysians to have led Malaysia through her years of turbulence. He could have been one of those rare people to unite both East and West Malaysia and perhaps even close the gap on the country, Singapore, which we once kicked out of the Malaysian Federation over 60 years ago, but which now uh, leads Malaysia in almost every metric you care to mention. And so, dear viewers, may I present my conversation with Dato Sri Idris Jala. You've got Malaysia blues You've got leadership blues You've got Malaysia blues You've got leadership So Idris, um, thank you for doing this. We've known each other at least professionally for over 10 years. I want to I wanna just recollect the first time we met, actually, in person. This is an interview we did on BFM. This is going back early, maybe early 2010, 2011. I was, um, I was in the studio by about 6.55. And by the t- AM, okay, <laughs> and by the time I got there, I'm usually the last one there. But you, you know, people get there very early, right? But when I got there, you were already there with your wife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember? This is when your early days in Pomandu, right? You were there, and I remember you had a very big Manila folder about this thick, okay, <laughs> with a lot of post-it notes all sprinkled all along those chapters, and you were already sitting there with your cup of coffee, rifling through the folders, getting ready for the interview which was only to start at 8.05 in the morning. Yeah. So you were there about an hour and 20 minutes early, okay? And you were one of the first people in the, the studio. I think there's only two other people there. And then we started the interview at 8.05. <laughs> and those days we had live call-ins, right? <laughs> and you, I think, will still hold a record on BFM as the only one who has had the longest live interview with live Collins for one, I think one and a half hours. We did that until about 9.25 I, in I the morning. <laughs> yeah. The most impressive thing about that interview was whenever you got a phone call, uh, whenever you had a query from the, from the audience, right, mm-hmm. which you did not know the, which for, uh, on a rare occasion, you did not know the answer to, you went to the exact place on the very thick folder and you knew exactly where to find. Mm-hmm. And then you got the data from there. So I thought to myself, this guy is pretty special, okay? <laughs> pretty special. First of all, you were there in the, uh, in the early morning, no PA, no bodyguard, no officers, no press, just you and your wife. <laughs> very, very rare, okay? None of that fancy schmancy JLC nonsense bullshit, right? Pardon my English, right? And then you impressed me with your knowledge, your expertise, your recollection of data. You're able to be spontaneous. So, th- I mean, in terms of leadership, lah, you're right up there at the best, okay? So let's start this discussion with how a boy from, from the barrio in Sarawak becomes who you are. Talk to me about the era in your life. Yeah, I was born in, uh, in, in the jungle of Borneo to begin with. Uh, and we were tribal people. My great-great ancestors were headhunters. Kalabit, right? Kalabit. Yeah. 
they were head great great and they were head hunters and so we were put in such a remote place and the importance of education was on the pedestal everybody in in barrio said you must pass your exams during the indonesian confrontation very early period we had the british soldiers camp in my village to protect us against indonesia lah there were ss soldiers there and i recall clearly when i was a kid they watch movies within the barbed wire in the open field but we were able to go and see the movie from the other side of the open field where we couldn't enter the 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 fence up area years later i realized then then at that time that elvis presley was actually not left handed because <laughs> we were watching from the other side you see <laughs> the moral of the story was this imagine i was born in the jungle of bonio and everybody told us there was a world beyond the mountains and to see that world in the movie is you got to pass your exams so when i grew up passing the exam was like it's a must and you thou shall never fail your exams and if you fail it's like consigning yourself to death and so people like me and my cohort of kids we studied as if our life depended on it fantastic and so that was that was a starting point the focus on the things that you re- related the story about uh, why i wanted to be early and why i prepared all my notes for the interview i always had this view that to fail to prepare is to prepare to fail and that, that's the attitude that i carried on in studies and in work as well always be prepared always prepare for everything you do that's why the folder has got all the things there and you must study your facts you must know what you're going to talk about you cannot just turn up there and do something in prom tour the same thing with work the same thing to study that's been the approach throughout my life lah yeah so i want to flip this question okay because the question that would normally people ask is um you know um how did you get from the jungle how did you study hard and all that right um and, and you're this un- un- underprivileged i want to flip the question around and say if you had been born in the richest country in the world the same idris jala right with with not the same disadvantages with not the same um, lack of privileges if you were born in the richest state in america say california to wealthy parents yeah. do you think you would be the person you are today probably not probably not right probably not and uh, the reason for me was simply because the circumstances really forced us down the track and i i would never know if you like like robert frost once said you know in this his poem you know the only thing you can know yeah the only thing you know is it's different I don't know whether I will succeed in that new world that you describe but I don't know it would have been different in prob- probably not so describe the 10 year old Idris Jala what kind of hunger do you feel it was as said it was life depended on passing the exams it really was important so when there are 15 of us that passed from barrio school and we went to marudi first term exam number 1 to 15 came from my class wow yeah i mean so all the town kids were amazed The reason was we studied as if life depended on it you see today the kids in barrio they don't have the same hunger and for us it was such an important thing and so reading was a very important thing for me then because i wanted to see the world beyond there were books and we had very small library in the in the, in, the, in the school so all of us i volunteered to be a librarian because i wanted to make sure that i get hold the book before everybody else does if you had not seen the world because of the movies that the soldiers from the british soldiers were watching would you not have known what existed i would so and then wouldn't have known it so the presence of those soldiers and the media yeah. they were consuming were pivotal to the young pivotal yeah because it it opened our eyes to world beyond the mountains So that was the only time I knew there was a real world outside there and that world a fantastic world. So it's not enough to top your exams, right? You still need to have certain breaks that come along your way because I'm presuming your parents were not some wealthy upper middle class okay. people, right? My so dad you st- was a teacher. So you still need some breaks along yeah. the way. What are some of those breaks? Yeah, my dad was a teacher. So in a, in a sense that he taught me in the classroom and he also taught me at home. So at, at, when we went back home we continued to do the homework. and so uh, that was a very important thing for me and my dad played a very big part in in pushing me up to uh, to do that the big break for me was you know in life you know chuang 
There are many things you don't control. I wanted to be a lawyer. I never became one. And so I was, it was really a big problem for me. So I was supposed to go, to go to New Zealand and I didn't do it because my offer was late. My auntie was holidaying in Europe. So they told him if you give me the offer, I must not send it to Mario because it will get lost. And she worked in Shell at that time. And so the, the offer never came in my mind. By the time it came, it was late. I had a scholarship, it was meant to go there. So I had everything, but I just missed it. So I went to Penang. The big break was, I would have, that's a huge change in my life. And I went there and I was very, very desperate and I didn't really want to go to USM. I met my wife there, by the way. And it was a very important part of my life, having met my wife there. And I, if we didn't meet there, you know, then I would have had no Leon and no Max. I probably wouldn't have worked for Shell too. I'd be a convincing lawyer in Miria. And that's a huge departure from what I wanted to do in my life. And I, I was very unhappy about that because that was not my plan. And so at that point, I thought then I said, uh, well, I wanted to go and do uh, academics. I want to be a professor because I was a top student in our graduating year. So USM offered me a scholarship uh, and also an academic staff training scheme to go to Pennsylvania, uh, University of Pennsylvania, all sorted out. So I left my books in Penang. I came back for holiday only because Shell said there's a job offer for interview for human resource in Miri. And if they give me the, the ticket, or if I got called for the interview, they give me the ticket. So all I wanted, Chuang, was I wanted the ticket. So I wrote, wrote the most cocky letter and I said, I am the man you're looking for. Because <laughs> all I wanted was the ticket. And I had no intention to really work for them, but they gave me the ticket. I did get the job since I had nothing to do during the period prior to, uh, it was June 1982. Then my, my intake to Pennsylvania, uh, Wharton School was uh, 19, uh, was September 1982. So the intervening period, I might as well work. And I fell in love with the job. Sheldon Conter offered me, look, if you really want to stay with us, you want to do, we will send you to do your master's. That moment in your life, right, when you wanted to go here, but you ended up going there. Yeah. And sometimes life moves in mysterious ways, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, are, are you a, a man of faith, Idris? Yes, yes, because yes, yes. have you ever tried to look upon that period and, and try and intellectualize what happened, right? Yeah. And understand why is it that, you know, whatever you want to call it, the universe or God or whatever, said, okay, you want to go here, but you shall not go there, you shall come here instead. And going here, open up these doors. Yeah. You met your wife, you did this job, then you got the shell, and then, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever tried to explain that to you? I mean, trying to make sense? Yeah, I, I do believe this uh, in life. More than 70% of what happened to us is outside our control. More than 70%? More than 70%. If you, if you don't believe me tonight, you write down on a piece of paper, 10 big things that happened in your life and ask only one question. Did any of these things happen exactly the way they did because you caused it to happen? Yes or no? And you put a tick and put a cross, you count them. In my case, more than 70% got not exactly the way I wanted to do them. Actually, for me, on a personal note, I, I, have, I have it inverted. To me, it's about 30%, 70 yeah, input. You but you are 30% input, 70% external. External. The things that they happen exactly the way they did. They didn't happen exactly the way they did because the forces that caused things to happen, they were more than... So I believe there were divine interventions. So, do you believe in destiny? Yes, I do believe in destiny. How do you intellectualize that? I believe that God preordained us with a plan of what, we, what He wants to us, uh, what He wants for us to have. But we, we must then succumb and surrender to the plan and allow it to happen. For example, if I didn't want to do it, if I resisted it, then it wouldn't happen. The predestination, uh, the preordain, it comes with choices that you have to make. There's a plan that God wants to have for you, but if you accept the plan, you must surrender and allow it to happen. If not, then, then it doesn't happen. So what do you say to the phrase that um, only dead fish go in the flow? Yeah, I think if you, if you do that, it's called drifting. Yeah. You, you drift with endlessly without the, the, the right uh, way you want to go. So what's the subtle distinction here? R rather than drift, but to go in the flow, but then to do it to the best of your ability, yeah. to the best of your efforts. Yeah, I think you need to be very clear about your true north the definition of what you really want in life. If you are unclear about your definition of true north, that is not very concrete. It's a very clear purpose of what you want to do in your life. That needs to be very clear. 
And therefore, if you do that, if you don't have that, then you drift. A lot of people, even at the very uh, late part of their lives, they don't really know what they're there for, right? Yeah, people, that's why people ask themselves the meaning of life, right? Yeah. So how do you, at what point in time did you ascertain your true, true north? That happened when I was in 1973 and we were, I don't know if you, you know about the Barrio Revival. There was a revival in Barrio in a Christian community. I was in the thick of that revival and it, it touched all the students there. And we were preparing for, for our, our Form 3 exams. And for some reason or other, we had uh, a spiritual awakening. And everybody was on their knees crying, you know, we were just in, uh, before you know it, we were out there preaching. You know, I walked for five days in the jungle from uh, Barrio to Long Puluan, and my sister walked five days to Long Lalang. We spent a whole two months preaching. And the whole village was consumed by the Holy Spirit if you like, that, that's how the revival became. 1973, I was, I was a very tender age, 15, yeah, I was 15. And that time, you can see, that was the time for me, the purpose of what I wanted to do in life was became clear, the true north. I was 15 years old. What was that purpose established at that age? Really, I wanted to make, for me, make a real difference to rediscover my, my true potential. And I wanted to achieve my full potential. It was very clear to me I wanted to achieve my full potential. And I kind of believe that we have tremendous potential, but we, we do not really achieve our full potential. Most people, I believe that 90% of us get buried underground, not achieving our full potential. So that barrio revival you talked about, where the whole village yeah, yeah, was right. visited by the Holy yeah, Spirit, yeah. as you say, right? Yeah, right. That, that, is, that is a pretty rare phenomenon, right? It's, it's only been certain parts of the world. I think Portugal yeah. is one of them. And yeah. um, What happened during that time? How, how do you intellectualize again that, that event? It was just supernatural, you know, the things so that you touched you. The, um, did you see? No, I didn't see anything did specific. But I, could, I had a personal encounter with God and I was on my knees with my friend. And what we didn't realize was what was Can happening. You describe that, that, that encounter? Actually, the starting story was this. We were preparing for our stroke junior exam. So we decided to have a, a timetable when we studied geography and we studied history and English and etc. Then we decided to put specific thing on our study program to pray and read the Bible. As we were doing that for two weeks, more and more of the time spent was prayer more and more reading the Bible, then it became even more. So I think it was the third week that we had a personal encounter with God and I really felt the outpouring of, of God in my, my, my thoughts and my, my emotion, etc. I felt totally wretched and we were both crying on our knees to God for, uh, for confession. It was a, we thought ourselves, this is very unusual. Let's not tell anybody about our personal encounter. What we didn't realize was the same phenomenon was happening amongst all the other kids at the same time. They were having personal encounter of the same experience. So on a Sunday afternoon, we went to a Christian varsity fellowship <laughs> and then it erupted because all of us had that same experience. That was how it's like a small bushfire lit up, consumed the whole village in that in a spiritual awakening sense and that was how the whole village people who had conflicts they had marriage they had reunited uh, disputes over land was settled all sorts of things was happening there it was incredible period for the village so how would you counter people who are atheists and say you know um it doesn't exist yeah i think this is at the point of a personal encounter you can read the bible some people believe and don't. Faith is an issue around. You cannot justify, you cannot put rationale behind it. But if you don't have a personal encounter, you cannot then have faith. And I had a personal encounter. Wow, okay. So that's and that was 15 years old. Huh? Yeah, I've heard stories about like this, or, you know, from different people and it's changed their lives in material ways. Yeah. So, so, then, so then you joined Shell, right? Yeah. And, then you and by the way, what I said is that that cohort, although we didn't study, we were out preaching. Huh? Yeah. It was the best exam results in history of that school to this day. No? Have you ever looked about, you know, those other 14 kids, right? Where are they now? Oh, many of them, they are magistrate, they are one of them, they are justice, they, we have CEOs, you know, many lawyers, etc., business people. So they've all done well. They're all done well. That, that cohort was an incredible group of people. 
That's quite incredible. Yeah. Okay, so then you join Shell. Yeah, join Shell. And then you become somebody that the government of Malaysia chooses to pluck from, you know, yeah. from the corporate world to go and head one of, you know, in fact, or probably the, the country's most um, progressive reformation, reformative uh, agency, Pemandu, right? Yeah. So what happened in Shell? Well, how long were you there? And how I was in Shell you? for 23 years. I went to, spent four years in, in Holland, four years in London, three years in Sri Lanka, and many, many different jobs. So during 23 years, I had the opportunity to do all sorts of jobs in sales, in marketing and human resource, in re-engineering. Name it, I was there. I was in the LPG business. I was in oil and gas business, all sorts. And that was formative years for me. And in a way, you could call it lucky or, you know, divine intervention. But I was put continuously in positions where either the jobs required someone to turn it around. So I repeatedly were assigned to projects or businesses where Shell was losing money. And so I went out there and I didn't learn what it takes to go and turn around companies. And that was my starting point. So I did many of these in Sri Lanka, I did that. And I headed in London, uh, the SWAT team for the downstream for the whole group. So when we have problem in, in Brazil, we have in Argentina, my team and I would fly there and sort it out in the downstream. We call it the business development consultancy. I was the head of that group at that time. So during that period, I kind of honed some of my skills, my own belief on what works and what don't work. And that was a starting point. Then prior to this, how the government spotted me was we had a business here in uh, we had a plant in Bintulu, a gas to liquid plant. We lost money for 10 years. They then said, Idris, why didn't you go back to Malaysia and sort it out? So I turned up on, in June 2003. Everybody was defeated, John. Nobody had any hope in that company. 10 years, losing money every year. Morale was, shit. Morale was absolutely rock bottom. So the day I arrived, normally, typically, when I get into the job, I gather a town hall of people and I tell them, where are we heading? that we want to turn this around. And you know, the morale was so low. There was one Dutchman that said, you'll never make money here. Idris said, uh, why don't you put you and I have a wager. If you make money, I'll pay you 100 ringgit. You know, Dutch people don't make big bets. <laughs> and so <they> only, <laughs> like very Scottish. small bets, yeah. So, so he put the bet there. In six months, he lost. And so we were making money from a company that had heavy debts. By the, my third year, and the government owned uh, an equity in the, in, the, in the company, and that's how they knew. So in three years, we made net profit after tax, 509 million uh, ringgit, and we paid all our debts. By the time I finished my third year, the company was debt-free. If you take the profit as percentage of capital employed, it was one of the most profitable companies at that time in Malaysia. It was neck to neck with Asiata, if I remember, not Asiata, uh, uh, one of those maxis. So turning around lost causes has become a career for you, right? Yeah. Because you still continue to do that till today. Um, what are some of the key principles? I think the first, the starting point is that you have to segment your PL. That means bring the profit and loss statement to the lowest common denominator in this. Example that I gave earlier on, you start by saying, I break down the profit and loss statement by individual customers to break them down. In Malaysia Airlines, the starting point is break the profit and loss of Malaysia Airlines by individual flights. Proton, by business model. A university, do it by program, engineering program. So you know exactly which one is sick and losing. And losing. Then you begin to find solution. Albert Einstein once said, if I'm given 60 minutes, one hour, to look into an issue, I will spend altogether 59 minutes examining exactly the nature of the problem. So to me, if you segment the PNL to the lowest common denominator, you are exacting in the diagnosis of the problem. Then your prescription for solution is precise. Example, you used to have four flights going to London when I was in Mass. When you broke down the PNL, we had 110,000 flights in a year. We had 110,000 profit and loss statement. Every flight. Then we found out the same two flights was making money flying in a, from Kuala Lumpur to London. The same two flights was losing money because the wrong time to arrive. 
So what solution? Get rid of those two flights. And the very next day, London is profitable. We didn't know that until we broke it down by PL. When I was to sell MDS, we were doing customer profitability. It was a B2B business. And so we knew exactly the customers that bought our product and we were losing money. So we got rid of those, cutting the tail if you like. We started to sell our product to customers where we were making money. And you wouldn't know this. So Proton, I did some work for Proton uh, before. And uh, I told them that we, they needed to do this. Can you give me a guess which model in Proton makes the most money? Guess. Saka. Yeah, loss. Lost money? Lost money. And that 70% of the assembly line was to produce Saga. And which one makes the Saga most? Saga makes the most money. No, the, lost the most loss. Money. Which one makes the most money? That's one. Badana. No, actually Isora. Oh. That is why if you don't understand that Isora was the one that makes you the most money and he put 70% of your assembly line to produce a loss making model, then you cannot solve the problem. That's why when Geely bought them, Geely sold immediately X70 because that's the same model that looks at that market called the Exora model. That's how they, that's why that model was the first that Geely produced because when I was sitting there on the chairman of the committee that helped them to, to do the turnaround, we did the PNL analysis. That's the starting point. But I, there are many other steps, but it's the most important starting point. Any doctor will tell you, the more precise the diagnosis, the more precise the prescription. And that's the starting point. And if you don't do that, you're going to come and give Panadol to everybody because everybody is having symptoms of fever. So can I just say, right, um, some of the solutions that you prescribe will work in a, uh, in a company like Shell, which is run very professionally and very transparently, right? In the Malaysian situation where you've got GLCs, right? Um, there's a profit and commercial motive, sure. and then there's a social motive as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then there's a political dimension as well. Yeah, sure. So so those, those, those are the challenges. And some people might say that, you know, whatever you did at all the good work that you did at MAS, it still loses money till today, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And Proton, was it not for Gili, would have continued to lose money and maybe it gone into receivership, right? So, so how do you how do you deal how did you deal with those things? Yeah, the reality is this: you have to deal with the three points you said, the profit side of it, nation building, and uh, the political side. Right. So you have to make sure that you do what you can control. What I can control is what we can do on the profit side. What I really cannot control is the political side. But if you know what you're doing, you can make a trade-off. Life is a trade-off. For example. I want to, we wanted to close our lounge in Singapore at that time. So we did close it. The minister said to me, Minister of Transport, oh, you can close any lounge in the world, but not the one in Singapore. Why? Cannot lie, pride. So we put a notice outside, close for renovation <laughs> and reopen, because it's no big deal. Yeah. We were not saving a lot of money, so that's fine. But if the government insisted that we would fly certain routes and we were making so much losses, then I put my foot down. I said, look, these are the things we can do, but these others we cannot do because I understand the trade-off. And so, so that's why we cut Manchester. To, to break even flying from Kuala Lumpur to Manchester then was we needed a load factor of 120-40%. That means get another 40% more passengers tie on the wing of the aircraft. I said, it's not possible. So, I mean, you have to put your foot down on the things that really matter. Choose your battles if you like, whether it's the political battle, whether it's nation building battle, whether it is the profit battle, choose them. And I think life is a trade-off and that you have to choose where you make concessions, where you don't make concessions. The people element would have been the most tr troublesome, right? Because at Shell, Shell typically t hires the best and the brightest. Yeah. In GLCs, they don't necessarily hire along those lines. Yeah, they hire for political reasons. We, we were overstaffed. Yeah, very too, um, at the time, and I, there was no way I could reduce the manpower if I didn't come with a, an attractive uh, voluntary severance scheme. And so that's why I sold our building, how it kept us 130 million ringgit, move everybody out to the airport. So that's a and, financial solution. Yeah, one, one and that was the only reason why I wanted to I wanted to reduce it by 3,000 people. At that time, to be clear, I was told that getting rid of 3,000 people is the single biggest one-time activity in the corporate Malaysia. 
So in one month or two months, we removed 3,000 people. Anyway, in a way, I was cleaning up house. You know, so I then used that with less people and then focused the team that was left behind to really get down and do the thing that matters. So, you know, it was a very start, big starting point. And I have the view today, every person in the company, wherever, whichever you go to, they only push themselves maybe at best, maybe 30% or 40% of their full capability. Even they're poor. If you get the poor guys who are not competently trained to work differently, you'll find the outcome is incredible. Yeah. So when I went there, I didn't bring anybody with me. I had only, um, no, I wouldn't say that. I brought one guy to come along with me that time when we started with, to go and do that work. But everybody that I used in mass were existing people. We didn't bring a team from outside to come and do it. So we used existing people because I have inherent belief that the existing people actually can do far better what, than what they do today. Yeah, yeah. anybody can, right? Yeah, everybody. But it's the change in mentality, it's the change in culture. Yeah. So you had come into MAS at a time when there was huge excesses, right? Yeah. I mean, there was stories of Bottero paintings in the boardroom, <laughs> you know, um, you know. I think they were paying 80 ringgit cost for Nasi Lemak, which would have cost 15 ringgit. Yeah. There's a lot of friends and cronies inside, the, you know, feeding off the carcass, right? Yeah. And then, of course, the people themselves, a lot of them were hired not because of how good they were, but because they were relatives of the yeah. bosses, right? So the culture of lethargy, the culture of non-performance, the culture of um, entitlement yeah. was probably endemic inside them. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I did a very interesting, uh, I would say, experiment. So we introduced a lab called 50 Ways, 50 Ways to Cheat Malaysia Airlines. So we then brought all the staff from marketing, from sales, from agents. They came together and tell me how, what are the 50 ways to cheat. And so you hide the hackers like we brought everybody inside. So we knew exactly what, what they were doing. And so we plugged them. In fact, there are more than 100 over, I can't remember the numbers now, ways. Then we plugged the holes. For example, travel agents would simply put fictitious names of people to come on the plane. Some names, even Elvis Presley. <laughs> uh, duplicates of names and things like that. So all sorts of problems. And when we knew this, we plugged some of those holes. And the most important thing about experiment was I was sending a message to everybody that we didn't want any of these things to continue. And that we will find a way and we ever catch you, we will nail you to the wall. And it's very important. So they knew that we were very serious about this, uh, changing the culture. So then the perpetrators, one phone call to the to the upper ups yeah. Hey, this new guy, he's trying to disrupt the status quo, get rid of him or make trouble. You know what, Malaysia, right? <laughs> make life difficult for him because some of them are connected all the Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, the thing was this, I had said no to the job in the beginning. And so I, I wanted to, uh, and when they wanted me for the job, I'm Tuna Blogdawi, you know, so I said I wanted to see the prime minister. So I had a meeting with him prior to saying yes. So I went with Asman Mukta, we went to see him and we went, I also went to see then uh, MK2 at that time, uh, you know, so when we saw then I said I wanted the free hand. I wanted to be able to run the business as, as a lot of free hand in doing this. And so I told them what I wanted and they said yes. But of course they are politicians, I knew that I had to take that with a pinch of salt. Not all of it would be okay, but I knew if I had 70% of their said what they said they would grant me, I would be able to run it. And that's an example. So I got right from the top the assurance from the Prime Minister. And I said to uh, Tun at that time, he was not Tun then, when I go there, would you come and introduce me in my first town hall with the staff? Which he did. So when I went there, day one, we had a town hall all the staff were there, I'm on the top managers, about 900 people in there. So, uh, uh, Pala then introduced me as it is your new CEO. And he said, when I finished giving the talk, he wants me to leave. And he told me, he wants me to leave because he is coming to work with you to solve your family problem. He doesn't want me involved in sorting out the family problem. This is a family problem. And then I did tell him, will you please tell everybody in the town hall that the government will not bail Malaysia Airlines? But it had, and continued. And not so. during my time. 
So they, that was the front page of the newspaper. So that message was so clear. That is why they didn't give me money for redundancy payment. I had to sell the building. Eh? And other times they, they gave them money for all sorts of things. I didn't want it because I said, look, let me raise the funds to do what is needed. What we needed, like sell the building to get that to pay for redundancies. But other people would have gone out to government and say, give us the handouts, then we can do all this. I didn't want that. So, I mean, the key point was, I had assurance from the Prime Minister, Minister of Finance too, as, at the same time, and, and, and to have a free hand in doing it. 70% of them, they own it, which is good. Enough. The 30%? 30% I considered. I, like, like, I concede, you concede on the 30%. So and you have to have a better than 50% better. winning? Absolutely. Example, you know, there's no way I could get rid of rural at, 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 at the, uh, our segments. Because that was have been catastrophic. Law, right? Yeah. So, so what we did was, he said, okay, if we do this rural air service, then my negotiation was, if you don't want us to raise the the price because the government has a social obligation, then you must give us compensation for doing it. In the so we had there were under the GLC transformation. There's one book called the Silver Book, and the Silver Book defines exactly what to do with the circumstances. So I used the silver book. I said, this is your book under GLC transformation. I'm applying this so that you then compensate us for continuing to fly rural air services. And so that's how we created mass wings because they didn't believe that we were honest and, and proper in our submission of the losses. You know, the problems that beset um, Malaysia Airlines and Proton and a few other GLCs, right? In those days, 20 years ago, yeah, yeah. those same problems exist today. Yeah, I think the problem is they stop doing the thing. It's like a game of football. Right. You have uh, Alex Ferguson was there for 20 over years. They made they were very good when he left. Everything collapsed. So it's a turnaround specialist, right, yeah. Idris? Um, you can turn around. It's, it's like a diet, lah, right? You yeah. can you can go this crash diet, lose your 50 pounds, whatever, come down to trim, and then you put it all back on again because yeah. you don't have the discipline, right? That's a very good point. Uh, yeah. Chuang, for Malaysia, for, so cor for corporate Malaysia, right? Yeah. How do you deal with this? You must make sure that the chain stick. The stickiness is very important. That means you have to stay long enough, one, as a CEO, to turn it around, from turn around to transformation. Stay around long enough to make it stick rather to make the changes institutionalized. In the last four years, we've had three prime ministers. That is the problem. You cannot have a, a, a changing like that. In a, in Nepal, I think it's uh, last 22 years, they have 20 prime ministers. They, we are a mess. A mess. You cannot have a country run with just that kind of uh, discontinuity. So you really have to have, to have enough uh, continuity in, in, in moving forward. So one of the things I remember from your time was the whole issue of low-hanging fruit, right? Just to get results, fast results, fast, right? But the thing is, um, it doesn't make the weight stay off, right? Um, and Malaysia's problems is this, you know, I, I think as you say, you know, one of the, I think the World Bank put out a report saying that Malaysia has got one of the most price controls in the world, yeah. right? We have it easy and we've had it easy for so long. Yeah. Not because they wanted the best for citizens, you know, necessarily. It's because it was conducive from a political standpoint. Yeah. The problem with that is like, it's a little bit like taking a drug. Yeah. Once you take the drug, you're stuck to the drug, you're addicted to the drug. Absolutely. And then to get off the drug, it's impossible, nearly impossible. Mm. What's, how do you solve Malaysia's problem? I think that because to go from the short term yeah. to sustainable long term yeah. advantage, you know, benefits, how do you do that? I, I think, the, the, for me, I have I've seen Malaysia for quite some time now, having been a minister for six years. Our problem is easy to fix. I would say easy to fix. And the reason is very simple. If you look at Malaysia's problem today, our fiscal deficit and our debt to GDP is not a big problem as many other countries. And our biggest problem is our tax revenue as percentage of GDP is hovering around 10%, 10 10.8%. That means we're not taxing enough. If you take the whole of Africa, they are poorer than us. Take the African continent, they are tax revenue as percentage of their GDP is 16%. And if we were to say, okay, let's now improve our tax game so that we'll then collect same average as Africa, la, including some of the very poor countries. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, 30% in uh, the Nordic countries, which is 30, 34%. 
just be the same as Africa. We have enough money to do many things. Today, our problem today is we are really have very narrow space, fiscal space for doing many things. And if we get that money, we can reduce our fiscal deficit. We can pay off our debts. Then we still have money to focus on what really matters. Things like education, fundamental transformation on education. And to me, long term, the answer rests with that. But you know, another one, I think human capital is public health. It's good today, but it's not sustainable. So we really have to focus, and that's why Obamacare and all these problems they see. As we grow, demographic trends in, in, in Malaysia change. People live longer, and the current model is just unsustainable. So what you say is absolutely true, right? And if you think about it from two, two standpoints, the income side and the expensive yeah. side, right? Malaysians generally, the ordinary Malaysians, there isn't enough headroom for them to pay more tax. Yeah. It's maybe to be more efficient to tax the rich, right? Sorry? GST. Okay, GST is one thing, right? Yeah. I, I believe GST is the answer because you are spreading it out for... A I, I, do. Tax. I, I do. I, I do. I do yeah, agree with you. Tax and gonna work. I, I agree with you. I agree GST is a solution and that's why it's adopted by 90% yeah. of the countries Absolutely. in the world, okay? But in terms of the income side, right, because to tax people, for them to even pay the GST yeah. per good and service performed, right, they need to be making more money. And that's linked to education, I that's see. linked to culture, that's linked to productivity, yeah. etc. Long, Long term. term. But I would say today, Africa is poorer than Malaysia. Our tax to GDP is much lower. If you take Tanzania, the, the VAT rate is 19% no? yes, with zero. And Sri Lanka is a bank, bankrupt country, 15%. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at their numbers, these are poorer countries than Malaysia. And yet we say, oh, you can't do it. So in life, when you talk about leadership, right from our prime minister and minister of finance, when they do transformational leadership, it's about disappointing people at a rate they can absorb. And this is, I quote directly from Marty Linsky. I lectured twice at Harvard since 2012 uh, or 14. And uh, this guy is one of the lecturers there. His name is Marty Linsky. He says transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they can absorb. So in this case here, when you increase, you introduce GST, of course people wouldn't like it. So how do you make sure that they can absorb this? You make sure cash transfers is given for the bottom 40%. The vulnerable group, you give them cash. We already have BRIM, the equivalent. So use that. So the more we save, the more we then help the poor people, self social safety net. So I think these are the people that are going to be really suffering. And so you will then give them enough social safety net to, to solve this problem. But all the guys who can afford it, they can. If Africa can do it, Malaysia can. No, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. But for, for that to do to be done efficiently, yeah. it's got to come from the government, right? Oh. There's no other, it can't be driven oh, by the private sector, be, right? It has to be the government. But the, the policy framework in Malaysia is on a knife's edge, right? Yeah, yeah. This current government is on a knife's edge, right? Yeah. For them to do even incremental change um, for, for the good of the country, not for the people, because politics by nature is inflationary, right? Yeah, yeah. And politicians, and what they do, they drive costs up because yeah. they do popular things, which are not good for the country. Yeah. But for the policy makers now to do that, exactly as you mentioned, yeah. it's going to be very tough, <laughs> right? That's why Can the unity government do this? I don't know, yeah, right? I mean, they've got to be very, very elegant. I mean, they've got to be very savvy like you, lah, just to be able to, to voice this and to make it palatable, right? It's very tough, but that's what leadership is all about. If you want to transform a country, yeah. you know, PMX is a reformist in his promises. PMX? Yeah, yeah, PMX, yeah, PMX is a reformist. He spent 24 years in the wings waiting to reform. And that's why reformacy is there. So he has a golden opportunity to make it work. But he has to now translate Madani into concrete activities that will really make the difference. And so time is here. You have to do it. And so, but not everything is going to be plain sailing. It's going to be tough. So people must take pain to transform. No breakthrough without breakdown. And then the expenses side, right? The spending, right? Yeah, yeah, OPEX, yeah. DevEx, right? You have to cut um, some of that as well. Last year's, in fact, February's budget was the highest ever, 330 billion or something. Yeah. 
have to spend, right? Have to spend. But you've got to make sure that every dollar spent is every dollar allocated to its rightful Absolutely. end point, right? Not 10%, not 20%, not 30%, not leakages along the way, yeah. not loss of energy. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily happen. I can understand somewhat why they need to spend the money. That's fine. But the point is you need to raise the revenue. If you want to spend more money, you must raise the revenue. That's why least trust ran into trouble because he wanted to cut taxes but kept the expenditure running at, at its high because and the market, three yeah, three weeks. So, and that was also what Gotabaya did, Rajapaksa in Sri Lanka. And he came with the taxes that are so low and increased expenditure. That's unsustainable. So today, the current government has to figure out how to increase the revenue while it is trying to do all the things needed on the expenditure side. And you can't, you just run the expenditure exponentially that way and your revenue stays relatively flat, then at some point you've got to pay for it. And so hopefully they will come up with the reform that is required on the fiscal front to do that. What kind of people do you need in your team to run a reformist leadership driven government? You need people who are looking at the facts as they are without being colored in the beginning with the political considerations. Because politicians have political calculus. So, but you really look at it like a business, the way you run it, put the facts on the table, then you say, okay, this is how we, these are the problems, this is diagnosis, these are solutions. How do I now find a politically acceptable solution to bring the reform forward? That's my point about cash transfers for the poor people, getting rid of our subsidies. We tried to do it when I was in government, and in some of them was cut off as a result of change of government. But we need to rationalize the subsidies. We need to introduce the consumption tax, which is, you know, the GST. Uh, then we can do it. I have no doubt in my mind, our problem is not intractable. It's a much simpler thing to, to resolve. It's a people issue. People it's issue. A solution issue. Yeah. And, and the solution can be found. The political solution is deal with the bottom 40%. Because those are the people that really truly suffer. Don't worry about the top people. Don't worry about the middle. Let's isolate one conundrum right now and discuss yeah. it right openly. This whole issue about um, fuel subsidies yeah. and how it's going to be more efficient, right? Yeah. How do you think it can be done well? I mean, you just have to bring it to market. When you bring it to market, then you will find that competition become intense. You bring it to market, they will naturally, I, I believe, you should liberalize it. If you look at countries that liberalize it, the government does not need to spend so much money. So pay market price. Pay market price, bring it to market. If you go to Thailand, you yes. just cross the border at, at uh, this one, right? Um, to go to Thailand, petrol price is there at about four times the price of Malaysia. Yeah, you are. Yeah, right? Yeah. They're going to be up in arms. Yeah, yeah, sure. Up in arms. Yeah. That's why we, we, what we did before was the, the, the RON 97, we, we already brought to the market. So that, that price moves. But gradually, you have to find a way how to slowly bring it to market. But you cannot do it overnight. So if you do it slowly, people can adapt to it. There's no doubt many countries in Africa, poorer than Malaysia, they pay market price. In, if you know, it might be interesting if we do that because then you might have fewer cars on the road yeah. and less yeah, carbon yeah. monoxide poisoning. <laughs> I mean, con you know, ironically, it could solve the, the whole issue of livable cities Absolutely. in one small foot, right? That's why the MRT is a very important thing. I kind of felt very strongly that we needed to build the MRT. That's why we ran the labs. When we ran the labs under the government, that was the MRT was born in the lab. It was six weeks. We kind of felt that for the future of Greater Kuala Lumpur, we must build the MRT. We must then make sure that more than 40% of the people getting to the city, at least 40%, must come and use public transport. Then it decongests the city. Yeah, Malaysia's MRT came 30 years after Singapore had its own MRT. And some people say that the reason why we didn't introduce MRT earlier is because we had a national car. Now, my question to you is this, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Without having to discuss all that. Do you think Malaysia should get rid of some of its, some of its companies? Yes, I, I, be, I believe so, that if they are not, not necessary to own. And I, when I was in, in, in government, they, Proton wanted 1.5 billion ringgit, a loan, if you like, uh, to, to help them transform. And I was appointed the chairman. So I turned up in Proton's office, and the first thing I told them to do was produce a segmented P&L. 
And when we put the PNL there, we knew where the problem was. We also said the second thing was, we, we were using that to beautify uh, proton. And then we said number two condition for us to give you the 1.5 billion ringgit was that you find a partner that you will merge with, marry. But nobody will marry you if you look ugly. Yeah. So we have to make them look good. Yeah. That's how Gilly Renault was there. Many others were bidding for it. Yeah. So that's how Gilly came about and then that was the deal because we said to them you cannot come and keep knocking on our door for subsidy and for assistance. This is the last time. The only way we'll grant you the 1.5 billion. So I turn up in the office every two weeks. If you do this, the next week we'll give you 100 million. If you do this, we'll give you another 100 million. That's how it works. Until such time, we also overseared the, the, the acquisition uh, by a merger with Gili. That was how the partnership came. Because we told them, these are the two conditions. Eh? No other third condition. And that, in our view, was the way forward because it's checkered history. Yeah, of course. It's really checkered history. And, and I think the same thing happened with, uh, you know, uh, it's the same thing with Post Malaysia as well. Yeah, and, and you, are you told today yeah. is that if it was not for Gili's model, right yeah. up, Proton was saying he There's no sell his own cars. There's right? no way. I mean, one, one, X50 and yeah, X70 yeah, sunk. Yeah, and, and the only thing you can do is you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just Google how much money does a car company need to spend a year on R&D? Just Google. Two billion US. Huge. If you don't have two billion US for R&D, you're dead. Our market is small. There's no way. That's why Australia, they had the Commodore. It died as well, the national car. So you really have to spend two billion US dollars a year on R&D, otherwise you're dead. That's what Honda does, Mitsubishi, all of these. So to me, right from the beginning, it was flawed. When it started, it was good because the whole money was by Mitsubishi. That's when they first started. The Proton did not have to spend that money. That's why over the years when it divorced from, uh, from uh, 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 Mitsubishi, then obviously he didn't have the money to do the R&D. That's why the problem was, historically, it was just going to die. Yeah, the non-Mitsubishi models yeah. were junk. Junk. They couldn't, they couldn't handle it. That's why when they went out to Jili, Jili had then spent it. The Hatsu, when they came out to do the, the small car, what is the name of the small car? Uh, yeah. yeah. From Prodoa. Prodoa. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it yeah, it's, the Produa then used that their model, the Hatsu's R&D. No need R&D. Right? No need R&D because they borrow. This is the same thing here. So the R&D is spent by Jili. So if you look at Malaysia as a case study for your turnaround, you know, expertise, right, Idris? How would you reconfigure Malaysia? It's a country. Yeah. First thing to do is, as I said, increase okay, so the tax. On the, on the income side, right? Yeah. Once you do that, Solution. focus on two things. I would say absolutely key, education, really fix our education, really make it top notch. Secondly, I still believe public health because the future of a country, if a country is unfit, you realize this. Uh, statistically, yeah. Malaysia is one of the highest uh, non-communicable disease countries incidents in the world, one of the highest. Uh. That Which means- Such as high blood pressure? High obesity. blood pressure, obesity, you know, you know the, we have, Diabetes is really rampant in this country. A third of Malaysians actually suffering from diabetes. They don't even know it. So if your workforce are slow yeah. and lazy and tired, yeah. most yeah. of the time... Then you have a problem. Work. You can't work. It's a problem, right? So I do believe that the answer to that is preventive medicine. That means allowing people to go and do medical check very early on. And that requires money, yeah? <laughs> requires money. For the back and, and yeah. you know, encourage healthy life. Healthy lifestyle. From a very early age. Very you early age. Don't need to go for you don't need to go for medicine. Yeah. So I do believe those are two fundamental thrusts. I call this human capital interventions, education. What does education look like to you in this current era and well, into the next step? I mean, you, we think we're making progress, but the other countries are running faster than us. This is the key. Do you agree with the whole idea of tertiary education degree program, three years, you know? Paying through your nose. Yeah, that's fine. It's good, but you have to make sure that it's quality. It's what is quality. Quality? What is the quality. Quality must come out in two forms. One is the graduates that come out there are really the ones that the private sector really want. If you don't have 
quality people, we have a lot of unemployed graduates, and we we have quite a lot of them today. So my question to you is this, Idris, if you mm. go to university, yeah. you sit there for three years, yeah. you study a course, right? Yeah. Industry is moving at warp yeah, speed, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, sure, sure. It's not staying the yeah. rest of the time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right? When you come out, you already yeah, yeah. something that's maybe 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, sure, agreed. Get it. Yeah, I mean, so the government spent quite a lot of money on uh, technical vocational school, and as an example, and I do remember them. We have a thousand of them, and we spend uh, the government spend money by giving it to them. I think the uh, the thing to do is to rank them every year on employability of their graduates, from number one to number one thousand. So you say to them, if you're at the bottom of the pack, I don't give money to your institution. So there's lies, there's damn lies, uh, yeah. there's statistics. Yeah. If they join the public sector, do you think that's a... Oh yeah, the, the salary. So you do the employability and the salary that the graduates get out from there. I can tell you when I was there, the number one company, uh, uh, Tibet College was Penang Skills Development Center. FPSTC. Yeah, and they were fantastic because every graduate... Engineers. And yeah, but the problem is, because we have a a democratic way of distributing the money to all of them equally, then they are not allowed to grow because, uh, you know, not giving them enough money. So, to me, you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Take money from the ones below and they naturally die. You don't want zombies. Take the money and give it to the institutions that are quality and then they will then expand. More and more students will go and more the quality. It's a very simple thing. No rocket science. Just rank them on two parameters, put two columns in there, employability of the graduate and the salary of the graduate. That's all. And then you say, this is the way in which I rank you. This is the way I give you the budget. And it's simple. Last year, well, in fact, this year's budget, 330 billion ringgit budget, right? Yeah. 54 billion was spent on education. Yeah. We've got a huge allocation for the, it's more than 10%, it's about 15%, yeah. right? More than defense, more than, of course, more than the PMO, right? I think second only to, I can't remember what it was, right? Yeah. Uh, finance or something. But the kind of, kind of people we are churning out, not the best in the world. Yeah. So the thing is, um, we, we, we now live in, in an era of unprecedented yeah. innovation and change, right? Yeah. We've got things like decentralized finance. We've got things like artificial intelligence. We've got things like robots, you know. And people are still going to university to study law. Why? Yeah. You've got chat GPT disrupting you <laughs> now, now, now. now and and we are still churning out lawyers and you're going for medicine and what for and you're paying nearly a million ringgit to do a medical degree not specializing you know yeah, yeah. if you go and study law now in 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 one of the western universities you're going to spend maybe 350,000 ringgit over the 3 years that's crazy money yeah. to come out and be basically extinct yeah i have no problem with people I doing think education is caught up and I have no problem with, with the discipline of studying engineering, law, etc. But there must be quality. Lah. Because I fundamentally believe the most important part of education is developing the mind. People grow broad-minded, can analyze problems, can do many things. So I, when I worked for Shell, it didn't really matter what you studied, provided you are very good. And whether you did... We people, some people did history. Exactly. But they do very, very uh, good job in, in Shell. Yeah, there's only a very thin correlation yeah. between where you study and yeah. where you study Correct. success in life. Yeah. So now you study people your entire life, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. What do you think turns people on? There are a few things. One is making sure that the leadership get the best out of their people. The leadership get the best out of them. That turns people on. And how do you get the best out of people? You must focus on something that will really touch them, the hearts and the minds of the people. And you find a way, you have to introduce then a new way of working. The old way of working can work. If you don't find a new way of working, you cannot get the best out of people. That's why I run labs. Huh? You know that I, I'm a sucker for running labs because I realize that people work in silo. When I put them in a the room, there's no more silo because they sit looking at one another all the time. And I put them the data that they put on the table, the segmented PNL. And then they look at the data, find solutions to this problem based on this data. Don't give me all cock and bull story about anything else. Lah. Really look for the solutions here. But then you, you focus the mind. You, that's a new way of working, you know. When you get people, they don't look in silo, they know the prescription, they focus on the agenda at hand. And you tell them, by the way, I'm not giving you six months to find solutions. Six weeks. 
and I also want you to come out in six weeks, detailed actions of what to do with names of people to implement it. And I also said to them, when you finish this work, we will monitor you on a weekly basis through a dashboard. That's a new way of working. And when you do this, you get the best out of from people. And so I do believe getting the best out from people, that's where leadership comes in. And bringing a new way of working. That they come with completely new way of working to make sure that they get the best. You can have leadership that cajole people to make a difference. But if you do not introduce a new way of working, you do not get the best out from people. What are the five characteristics of a top leader? Number one, introduce game the impossible. That it means is? a game of impossible. That means put the target so high that cannot be achieved based on the current way of doing it. If your current way of doing can achieve that, it's not a game of the impossible. So you must put the target so high that everybody says our current way of doing is impossible to achieve. It will force the organization to come with a new way of doing. So second, for organization, corporates anchor everything on the segmented profit and loss statement, which I discussed earlier on. For government, anchor on the true north. Define the true north, which is not PNL. Huh? It must be very precise about the true north. Number three, introduce a new way of working and call it discipline of action. I just described earlier on how you got to go and do that. And number four, situational leadership. That means in the beginning of the journey, the leadership must be highly directive, cannot be too democratic. And when people know how to do it and they are competent in doing it, then you learn to let go. That I means only then you begin to empower. And so, number five is winning coalition. That means bringing people to come together to run with you on a common course rather than you running on your, by on your own. Those are the five things. Okay, so those are hard targets. Hard, yeah. hard metrics, right? Yeah. What kind of person should you be? People that want to be collaborative. No, no. What I'm saying is that you've got to be a certain kind of person. Yeah. You need to have a certain type of character. Yeah. You need to have a certain ability to, to gain um, acquiescence. Yeah. You need to have certain personal social abilities, personality traits. What are those personality traits? You need to be able to inspire people okay. to begin with. How do, you, how do you become someone who inspires people? I think you must go and talk to the hearts and minds of people. If you, don't, if you talk facts only, you'll never get them. What kind of person must you be? Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so it's easy to say, yeah, I talk to someone who on the hearts and minds, but, but what kind of person does that? Because a high achieving yeah. professional typically is what they call someone who's disagree disagreeable, right? In psychoanalytic circles, they call it agreeable people and disagreeable people. Yeah. Typically, hard-charging male prof professionals are male yeah. and they're very disagreeable. Yeah. If you talk to a CEO, he's a bit of an ass, right? Yeah. But he's, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. But they're very target-oriented. Yeah. They can't speak to the hearts and minds of people. That's why successful CEOs tend to be able to, to be both agreeable and disagreeable. Yeah, I'll put it this way, Chuang. There are two schools of thought. I call that the yin and the yang. La. The yin and the yang means the doing and the being. So when you, uh, you post a question, what kind of persons do you want? That's a being question. Correct. And so if you des des describe the being question, you can get completely lost, you know. And someone who says, oh, the kind of things they require, integrity, transparency, honesty. But you have abundance of people like that in my village and they're very poor. How come they're very poor when they have all those attributes? They have honesty, they have transparency. The poor people have that in abundance. So, you, so I am of the view that you should look at the doing side. What is it that you do? The what you do is transform the being. So the arrow must point from the doing to the being. That means you're going to do those things that I described. When you do them, then the transformation of the being happens. I wouldn't want to reverse it the other way around. And so the consequence of what you do is that you become if you do X and Y and Z, you transform yourself, you transform the organization to become this, not the other way around. So the person who is able to hard charge yeah. and to meet hard financial metrics and industry metrics, 
but at the same time is able to talk to the hearts and minds of people Correct. in a very agreeable way, yeah. right? To get and them to come along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of the strength of character to see yeah. it through because it's tough. It's tough. You know, it's right? Yeah, yeah. For example, if you say, you know, how do you return to Martin, Martin Linsky's point? Transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they can absorb. You're going to pay tough measures. But how do you make sure that they can absorb it? So you have to find solutions that like will allow them to absorb it. For example, when we, we ran the lab on Pengerang, Pengerang is the single biggest little town where the, the most investment was poured into this country in the last 10 years. Every Petrona said we'll build, we'll build a huge petrochemical complex there, but we needed from you, Mr. Government, 10,000 acres of land. But there were 3,000 graves there. We, Petronas, cannot dig graves. So how do you give us this land that's got graves? You have to find solutions there. What was the solutions? We found a half of the graves were Muslim graves. But they told us the way to do it is to make sure that the, the Imam write a fatwa. Pre precisely how to dig the graves according to the fatwa. And if you abide by this, they were okay. But the Chinese grave was the other half. They can, you cannot put a fatwa. So then we discuss with them. It's very simple, the solution for the Chinese. If you have your ancestors buried there, if we relocate them into the new place, we we'll start a new business venture. They become shareholders in that business venture. Anybody that dies in that in the future, they become shareholders. Then voila, so. Do you know what? Do you know what? Just on that instance, it's just so ironic. It's just so telling of the, the cultures, the different cultures. Yeah. You know, the Malays are, are quite faith driven. The Chinese are just driven by money, money. right? Yeah. So that's a, so, so, so a yeah. Person. I mean, when you think, you pause and look at this problem and say, yeah. If you, you say there are 3,000 graves, which yeah. To them, right? yeah. If you say 3,000 graves there, this is the land that they want. Why is that land? Because deep water. Cannot be any other land. They wanted it because deep water port, fantastic. But you have 3,000, then you give up. Yeah. So and then you give up, then you don't do the reform. But if you want to do the reform, you have to find solution to make them prepared to absorb it. So the principle here is resonate at a very Correct. specific... Very specific. And it's the very doing related. Yeah, so that's quite telling, all right, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, where were we? So just in terms of the kind of people you need in the organization, yeah. right? Or the government, because governments are like companies, right? You need a good leadership team, right? This is what we do in Shell. Uh, let me entertain you with the idea of what we, we believe. And I think that's right too. In Shell, for more than 100 over years, we believe in four characteristics. He helicopter quality. That means people that have the quality that we hire them that can see overview. Helicopter can rise up. When you rise, the helicopter rise, you can see the whole wood. What is there, where there's a river is there, you can see overview. Helicopter can come down, huh? so you can see details. Yeah, so that capability is called a helicopter quality. So anybody that we hire in Shell must have the helicopter quality to be able to rise and see overview, to come down to see detail. Number two analytical skills. People that are very good analytically, they can break down problem into core component parts and then find solutions having broken down the problem. Number three was very important, imagination. People who can have good imaginative imagination to innovate and look for solutions. You must be able to have people that are creative. If you're just pedantic and you, are, you cannot have imagination to find solutions to it, then that's not the kind of quality we want. And the R, the last one, is called sense of reality. People who are not up in the clouds, their feet must be grounded on the ground. Everything that they recommend must be practical and pragmatic and can be. So this is what we call hair quality, H-A-I-R. Helicopter analysis, imagination and reality. So those were the qualities. And there was a study done in the 60s by Hans Muller and Van Lennep. They did a lot of huge studies. They were from uh, uh, Antwerp and I think uh, one, some of the universities in Holland that trace the quality of good leaders and good managers over time and did the correlation between the various parameters. Uh, and the correlation between hair quality and successful leadership was close to 0.87. That is, in, in statistical term, is really very, very good. And that was, that's how we embedded it. So, so we believe in Shell, 
those were the qualities. So we use that in a way how to hire people. Yeah. And so, but nonetheless, that's still the being side. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm of the view that it's the doing that drives the being. Yeah. And, and, and of course, um, those unicorns, which they are, right? Yeah. Because to have those, uh, that spectrum of ability in your mind is a pretty rare breed indeed, right? Yeah. So, but it's existed and that's why you've got Fortune 500 companies yeah. and people yeah. like Shell, right? But um, things are changing very fast. Yeah. Very, very fast. Very, Industry very is changing fast. very fast, right? Um, now people are a lot more touchy-feely, more compassionate, more emotional. Those hard-charging CEOs, which you also see on CNBC, yeah. typically male, typically yeah. white, you know, typically even Malaysia, you can yeah. see them, right? Very, very cold, mercenary-driven people, right? Yeah. Those executives might be dinosaurs in five years' time. True, true. I, I, you are right, you know. There's one thing that I think I described the shell uh, qualities, the four qualities. And the one thing that is missing in, entirely from all that is adaptability. Yeah. That today, the rate of change is so rapid. Yeah. And if true. people yeah. cannot adapt to the change so quickly, uh, and then you are in trouble, like chat GPT. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a firm of consultants in my team. The first time I knew about chat GPT, I sent a memo to everybody. This is my view about what we should do with chat GPT. And I said, we are consultants. The first part, part of call when you have a, a job to do, you check ChatGPT as a point of departure. Yeah. You do not ignore it, you embrace it. You put it down there, it gives you a framework to say this is the minimum that you needed to do. You then analyze what is good and what's bad in it, what you think ChatGPT put as a wrong, you discard it. The one that's good, take it. Then you develop your own research and others. Now, at the end of it all, you must then say, my rule of thumb is that your output must be 10 times better than ChatGPT. Well, that's not difficult, but ChatGPT is exploding at an exponential yeah. rate. Uh, what is getting wrong today, they'll get 100% right within a matter of months, I would say. Yeah, yeah, right? sure. And it's not just ChatGPT, there's Sydney, there's Bing, there's other... Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Anymore. So, uh, you cannot reject it, you must embrace it. And you can see a lot of universities are rejecting it. Yeah. That's the wrong thing to do. So you're an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah. Uh, Pamandu Associates, a lot of people don't realize Pamandu Associates is a private business now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Run by you, right? 100%. You've got two joint MDs now, right? Yes, yes. But you nearly went under during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when, the, when the pandemic came, we had a business model like this. When we, we became private, I told everybody, at the end of the year, all the profit that we make, we only keep two and a half months of retained earnings. Two and a half. All the profits it is given to uh, the partners and all the staff. And so we had, at that time, at the best of time, we had a model where the top 5% get 10 months bonus. The next 30% get 7 months bonus. The remaining staff get 5 months bonus. 10% will have zero. Because we kind of told them, perhaps you would better look out for another job. So we rang everybody. It's a very fiercely robust model and it worked very well. And we told ourselves, if we ever run out of money, we do a cash call. That means all the partners must put the money put on the table. So nobody as a partner want to have a cash call. And so we were very hungry looking for projects because nobody want a cash call. And it worked prior to the pandemic. When the pandemic came, nobody wanted to put the cash call because our prediction was 18 to 24 months. This roughly, thing will write. Roughly right. Yeah, that was, roughly that was roughly right. And we said it was 18 to 20 months before a new vaccine is put in place. Who is prepared to put 18 months of cash? Nobody. So it was a model that we had to change. A point about adaptability. Yeah. And so how did we change it? We had zero client. Huh? <laughs> we knew in two and a half months we run out of cash. What do we do? It's the first time in my life. I said, look, I'm the CEO of the company, I'm the chairman, I'm the founder, that I do not want to take the responsibility to make the decision. So we made a democratic vote. Wait, why did you not make that decision? Because I realized then I was leading a company that we were really trying to experiment something new. That's why I went there. I had many other offers to run big companies and I turned them down. I wanted to do something small and I wanted to experiment it. So I said, look, this experiment, it's such an important thing. I've got so many guys that are so good in my team and I didn't want to make a decision on their behalf. I wanted truly democratic vote. I had one vote where there were about 86 staff. So I said, let's make a legal voting 
possibility. We got a lawyer to draft all the concessions, uh, the agreement. We voted three options. Close down the company. Option two, that's May 2020. Yeah? March 2020, that was the first lockdown. Second option, mothball the company. Close it down, reopen 18 months or 24 months down the road. Option three, reconfigure. That means cut the staff by nearly half, get rid of the office permanently, and everybody have a salary cut. And I volunteered, I will have 100% pay cut for the whole period. The partners have 70% pay cut, middle managers 50% pay cut, and the junior staff 5%. So that was a sliding scale. Vote. 96% voted for option three. Okay, so if you got no money coming in, right, and your cash ran out after two and a half months, yeah. and the thing lasted 20 months, right, so how did you get money to pay ah, this? It was interesting. It was this is divine intervention. We had a very interesting thing that we did prior to the pandemic, and that was this. I told our guys, why don't we create a completely new business idea? That means you go to a client, that is a, who is interested to really rise, why don't we do a no cure, no pay? It's okay, yeah, no yeah, cure. No, right. yeah, we, if you don't achieve your, your big targets, you don't pay us. Of all the companies in the whole of Malaysia, we chose one, and that company is Top Glove. I had no idea the pandemic, eh? no idea. No way I would have known the pandemic was coming. It was Top Glove. So I went to see the, the CEO, the, the chairman. I told him, look, my team and I will put our guys there. For a whole year, I put my people here to do all the things to achieve your target. If we don't achieve target, pay us nothing. Now, the story was, when the pandemic came, they minted, they minted a of money. made a lot of money. Yeah. So think about so, it, Chuang. So was it because of your input that they did so well? Well, that's, us? yeah, I mean, was it? it was both. Right? Because it was both. For yeah, well. it was both because they made more money than yeah, history. Yeah. yeah. So it was the interesting thing was we helped them to introduce in their system a way how to deal with dynamic pricing. So they were dynamic in, in pricing, which we borrowed from Malaysia Airlines. So we introduced the system to help them to do dynamic pricing. So when the pandemic came, they were very quick in making adjustments on dynamic pricing. So that is why they made more money, I think, relatively speaking, compared to the other top glove, uh, glove companies in Malaysia for that period of time. But of course, the Durian Ruto was there. Now, did I have the wisdom to know the pandemic was coming? No. But why do you think of all the companies in Malaysia, we chose one, divine intervention. So when, when the thing happened, we got money from them because they were minting money, so we got this money. So with this money, we were then able to tide our problem during the period. Yeah. Without that, we'd have died, you know? Yeah. 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 And then we, we spun off to say, that why don't we, since we got nothing to do, I challenged my team, uh, a guy called Woody, and uh, he was a one joint managing director. Woody, why don't you do this? You and your team develop the only global COVID index that's approved by WHO that rank 180 countries every day during the pandemic from number one to number 180 in terms of death, the number of hospital beds, the number of mortality, etc., etc., and the preparedness on, on, on lockdowns, etc. So we did that. And within three months, we got the, we're the only index that ranked 184 countries every day since the pandemic. You can collect uh, global COVID-19 and we got companies that were so happy with the work they contributed some money to help us tide because we did for free in the beginning then we then asked for sponsors to come to help us develop it so in the, those two things the money we got from top glove the work we did on gci by the way by the time just to digress nobody in my team has ever done programming and i insisted at that time i wanted us to program it ourselves I didn't want anybody to hire anybody else to do the programming for the GCI index. And I, I pulled the teams together. Some of you have done, learn it in school at university, but never practiced it. But I want you to do it because we have no clients. Two years, we all learn how to do it. Honestly speaking, I was amazed. In four months, 
We got numerous calls with Dr. Ted Ross and everybody on WHO about it. We discussed with W, uh, with even, uh, you know, with Harvard, because we, Oxford the University, they had the stringency uh, ranking. We also discussed with them to borrow some. The Gates Foundation, they have their own index. We borrowed some of the tools, putting together. And that's how we came out in four months. Huh? So you can see what we were doing on a small scale basis, how we could pivot out from the problem we had. Probably the single most important ingredient to deal with a very uncertain world. So now, Idris, you're 65 years old, right? Yeah. Um, time flies, really, when you're having fun. How do you see the world nowadays? I mean, what kind of life principles do you want to pass on to people, you know, um, in terms of dealing, navigating this crazy, crazy world we live in now? I do believe leadership must begin, as I said before, all of us must put the game of impossible. I would say to you, for, for example, Chuang, to get the most out from you yourself is to put a target that you cannot achieve based in your current way of doing it. And it will force you to look for a different way of doing it. So the game of impossible is crucial. And today, if you don't introduce this game of the impossible, you will lose the competition because other people are running out to do this. If you step back and ask, why do I think that? And, and I, I told you before, the, the five, huh? that's one. I want people to also say, anchor on the true north. Number two, make sure there's discipline of action. Number three, winning coalition, situational leadership. Those are the five things I really believe people must do uh, to get there. But it's easier said than done. If you look at some of the top leaders, Steve Jobs, game the impossible, what did he do? The guy was incessant. He told everyone when they came with iPod, you may remember the first time it was so successful. It was the object of desire, 2003 when they released the iPod. He told his guys, this is a successful product, I want to make redundant. The guy was up in arms in Apple. But he said, no, the game the impossible. I want you to develop a product that is iPod, gave me music, that's a personal computer, that's a phone, three in one. Everybody say it cannot be done, but they have to reinvent themselves to do it. And when they did that, it basically made iPod redundant. And that's how iPhone came about. He kept on doing this game, the impossible. For example, when he insisted that they develop iPad, everybody in Apple said, you will cannibalize the Mac. But then the argument they said is, let's make sure that the iPad had features superior to the Mac, but it will not have all the features that the Mac have. For example, touchscreen, it has it, but the Mac doesn't have, the notebook doesn't have it. But it doesn't have the capacity, but the Mac has the capacity. So basically what he was doing, segment the product based on market. So I, I, I think it's so important. Jack Ma is an example of a guy that came with this ridiculous game the impossible that for him to say that why don't we take all the product from china by the smes so jack ma had this view the smes had loads of products in china but they cannot access the market that's how he created an e-commerce platform but he also discovered that they are full of middlemen in between the sme and the market so if he got rid of the middlemen so he get more money in the hands of the SMEs. And, but still when he sell to the customer, it's still highly competitive. That was all that Jack Ma did. He, it was a game, impossible. Have, game. You, have you ever asked yourself what happens to somebody's mind and hormones and you know, <laughs> mental thinking when you set yourself impossible tasks, yeah. right? Because no, nobody does that to yeah. themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, Everybody, yeah. And okay. You know why? So what, what does it trigger in your mind? The first thing it triggers is fear of failure. That's why we don't do it. But if you set yourself a target. Yeah, fear of failure. Then you can fail, man, because you've sure. got no, you got no yeah. here, right? So that's why when you set up the impossible target, you will face immediately the fear of failure because you now know that your current way of doing you'll definitely fail. Okay, let's discuss this yeah. a little bit further, right? Oh. So let's say, for example, I want to set myself an impossible task, yeah, yeah. right? Okay, what is an example of an impossible task? Okay, so maybe a, a fat guy wants to lose 25% yeah. Yeah. of his sure, weight, sure, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. That's a good okay, example. let's put it into reality, sure. right? Sure. So what must a person do? Yeah. Should he tell his friends, which is, okay, I'm going to lose 25% yeah. of... So once you yeah. publicize it, 
the ball then it's become, yeah, it becomes yeah, real, yeah. you know, then people are, hey, when are you going to start losing? Your yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So the first thing to do is publicly declare it. Okay. You, you publicly declare. Having now done that, then you can really research now how to do it. By the way, you Google today how to lose that weight in, in two or three weeks. There's so many solutions. The, the one, the fastest way to do is water diet, 100%. If you go on water diet, and uh, by the way, the normal clinically approved way to do it, you, go, you Google, go to YouTube, there's a guy that does it for 40 days. You can go for 40 days, drink water. Don't eat, eh? Don't eat anything, just drink water. So, uh, you know, I have a guy. See guys do it, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah but if you don't want that, that's tough, then you can find different ones. There's an example called the, three, uh, the uh, GM diet. So what you do on the GM diet, first day, you just eat vegetable. Yeah. Second day, fruits. Yeah. Third day, vegetable and fruits. Yeah. Fourth day, bananas and milk. Yeah. And the fourth day, fifth day, then you have a uh, fifth day, then you have some, your meat. Yeah. And then uh, meat, and then the uh, sixth day, meat and carbs. Yeah. And final day, carbs. Yeah. If you do that, guarantee lose weight. You just described a very expensive treatment in Switzerland, which all the millionaires are going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what they do that, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so it absolutely can be done. So you do the, re you go, you declare to the public. Declare. You then the research how to do it. You choose the, the, the one that you want, either the water diet or the GM diet, you choose. And you execute that. And the, the, the third thing you do, every day at seven o'clock, you strip naked, stand on the wing. Morning, morning. morning. Stand on the weighing scale, and, then you, and you see it. You catalog it. You catalog it. Stand on the weighing scale. When you stand, the weight cannot cheat. It's real. Then you, when you see that, you know you're monitoring it every day. So every morning, stand on the weighing. Scale. I guarantee you. In 2013, I did it actually. In 2013, I went on I the gym diet. I, I yeah, I did that. You were like that I was like that. In 30, 2013, I wanted to remove my weight, and I absolutely did the gym diet. In a, within a month, I brought, I got rid of uh, 12 kg. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so it now, can be done. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today, right? What's your what's the impossible task you've set yourself? The impossible task you set. What has Idris Jala set an impossible task for Idris Jala to do? I'm today? writing a book today. Okay, that's not impossible. No, no. For me, it's impossible because I'm running a job. Yeah. I'm having a firm there. For a long time, I wanted to do this, and I couldn't do it, and so. I have to change my, because I'm running a firm. I'm a grandfather. I spend a lot of time with my granddaughter. And by, by the end of uh, by September, I, I become a, a, another, we have another addition to the family. So my wife and I spend a lot of time with our granddaughter. I call her the, my favorite human being la, at the moment. And so these are things that are there. And I found it's very difficult to spend time writing. So if my current way of doing cannot achieve it, more than two, 40 years I wanted to do it, I couldn't do it. Yeah. So I now have, that should write a book is you. Yeah, so I now have decided that I want to do this thing. So this was the game, the impossible, because my current way of doing it cannot work. So I have reinvent a completely new way of doing it. So is it a chronicle? Is it a biography of your life? You no, know, it's just it about, principles? it's like what we're talking today. Principles. Principles. And uh, I will, uh, the book begins with uh, the principles and I don't talk about Idris Jala. I talk about other leaders who have done the same thing I observe. So I studied a lot what Jeff Bezos is doing, Jack Ma, what others would do, what were the common traits amongst athletes, people like uh, even uh, uh, Usain Bolt, you know, what they were doing, what was common amongst Usain Bolt and uh, 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 Sebastian Coe, and what was common with them with uh, Carl Lewis. And all those things are common, even including leaders as well, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Did you ever consider maybe not writing a book, but to do something in, in new media circles instead? Like, for example, like, uh, you know, a series of videos instead? Because, you know, people don't read yeah, books yeah. anymore. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It will, it will come in the form of uh, audio as well. Okay. So and that will be there. Audio, audio, it will be, it will be. So, so that was a, a kind of new thing that, you know, I knew that my old way of doing it cannot achieve it. So I have to reinvent. So I have to find different ways to do it today. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, so far so good. La. How do you find the time? I mean, what, what, what works for you in terms of like, you know, some people, you know, like Stephen King, he only ever wrote between 7 a.m. and like 11 a.m., right? Yeah. But in that four hour period, he was like incredibly productive. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got their method, la, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's, what was your, what is your... What I found was important was this. I have to get someone 
every Thursday to come to my house. Okay. And I tell the story to this fellow. So that fellow right down here. He writes down. But what I do with him is that he writes down, but when, because I can't tell to him in one, one and a half hours everything I want to say on that subject. There's a lot of things missing. So when he finished, before the next Thursday, I also write. So I write one piece and he writes one piece. So we, the next Thursday, when I finish my piece, I pass it to him. Then he tries to take mine and what he's written and put them, cobble them together. I would say today, like we've been doing now five chapters. 80% of them were my stuff. Okay. He's a professional writer, but the reality is that he can only write what I told him. Yeah. I can't remember everything that I told him. For example, uh, there's a story about the game of the impossible. Many years ago, I had a chance to meet Lee Kuan Yew. No? And when I met this Guna, you know him? Guna Segrum. He's my co-writer with me. Uh. I never spent time telling Guna about everything. But when he left, then I remember the story. When I was in Malaysia Airlines, we get people to gather together, all the CEOs of the airlines, and we get a guest speaker. Lee Kuan Yew was our guest speaker. So there was one question from one CEO, and I asked him the question. Uh, what is your vision for Singapore? It was kind of a game of the impossible. Uh. He said, you cried when you exited Malaysia. It's only YouTube. Huh? Why did you cry? And what, what's the hope? What you wanted to do? And he said, very simple. I cried because I kind of felt we have very little hope for success. What happened on the first day when you visited Malaysia? This is a quote, huh? he said. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it on YouTube. Yeah. I, he got people in his room. He said, I want all of you to put up your hands. How many of you have two options? Leave this country because it's hopeless. Migrate. Option two, we sit down and make Singapore a hub. No third option. Hub, logistics hub, financial hub, everything's hub, nothing else. And so all of them decided to stay. And he considered that a game of impossible because fundamentally they have to do it very different. They focus on really the one simple idea that he had in mind. And they're, of course, very successful today. There was one CEO from Air Mauritius. He said, uh, I come from Mauritius and I'm the CEO there. What can we do to turn our country to become a hub like Singapore? Do you know his reply? I, I, I think about it. He said, young man, you have no hope. If you have to ask me that, you've got no hope. Yeah, yeah. you have no hope. Yeah, so. Then he said, why did I say you no hope? I didn't mean you are no good. I didn't mean that your country is no good. Your hinterland is hopeless, Africa. In my lifetime, they will never get their act together. We were lucky because our hinterland, ASEAN, was growing. So we can become a hub. So the question for you is, hub for whom? If your hinterland, Africa, is in a mess, you cannot create a hub for Africa because Africa is not prospering. So you have no hope in your lifetime to make Mauritius a hub like Singapore. Any other question, nobody dare to ask. See, this is a story, you know. Very truthful, very candid. <laughs> very candid. So when I, I, ne I didn't remember this. So when I were, me and Guna were talking about the chapter one on the game, The Impossible, I don't remember the story. When he left the room, then I remembered it kept flooding me the story. So that story is in the version that I wrote. And uh, that's how we, we do it. So I find this new way of working, getting a, a co-writer with me. So when we write the book, we will be co-written by him and me. I, I, I presume you you know a lot of Kuan Yu's beliefs and sayings, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's, he's so, you know, he's such an elder statesman, right? I'm sure you also know what he said about Malaysia yeah, yeah, and his um, reservations about Malaysia. Yeah. So to Malaysia, to disprove Kuan Yew, is Malaysia's impossible task, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Right, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, the beauty for me is that our problem is not intractable, yeah. easily solved. Yeah. <laughs> it's, we, we're not like Japan, like Japan, debt to GDP is 260%. We're not anywhere near there. So we have tremendous I mean, possibility to do that. Yeah. 
that's yeah that's pretty hard so we can fix our problem it's actually two things to begin with i always believe in life eh? life is a trade-off you must understand how to deal with trade-off by keeping some constants and some variables like a calculus la. you must be able to say these are the constant these are variables and then you go focus on the few constant to make them work the constant for me is that if you don't fix your revenue as percent gdp you cannot move on your variables you cannot focus on education you don't money eh? you can't get money for public health so you got to fix that as a constant and once you do that suddenly you have the capability to do many things and it's not difficult but it's difficult because people say oh if i did this people are up in arms you focus on managing the the downside begin the cash transfers you then have to say to them you don't put the the tax one time like that you move slowly even gst you can move slowly i don't have to jump straight to africa you know you slowly no, no you're right and what you talk about is it's not a solution issue no. it's a human issue a human we need to have people to do these kind of things this, yeah no, it just yeah. you cannot imagine how much of a pleasure it has been to discuss with you all these thoughts and all your ruminations of your past 50 years and in career thank you so much for doing this it was a real honor and a real privilege thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.